we're going to um, begin, you know, Sheila has been doing some of the announcements, getting us ready for that. But one thing that we want to do leading up to the anniversary on the fourth Sunday in September, it, the fourth Sunday in September, is, um, is have 60 days of prayer. 60 days of prayer, um, and it will start on July the 25th. That will be next Thursday. But what we wanna do is on that Wednesday before, have a kickoff where we take our prayer meeting time and, um, and talk about how we will observe, we know that our church was founded on prayer, right? 1959, Reverend C.L. Potter and all of the um, charter members, they were uh, diligent in prayer and starting this church. And so we want to continue that tradition as we look to the 60th year anniversary. This year, we know it's typically on the third Sunday. Be quiet. It's typically on the third Sunday in September, but we're actually going to do it on the fourth Sunday in this, uh, this September. It's going to be um, September the 22nd this year. So please make sure that you mark your calendars. Help me, Jesus. See why we need prayer? Okay, Jaden. Okay, hold on. Um, pray for me as you lift up uh, this 60th anniversary. He just turned three, and he wants to make sure that everybody knows that he is three. Shh, stop, stop, hold on, hold on. We are um, excited. Jaden, stop. Yeah, you are. Stop. Um, we are excited about our guest speaker for this evening. He is on his way. Um, and we hope that you have been enjoying all of the topics that have been on Wednesday nights. Um, last week we had Reverend um, Darren Williams that led us in the um, Fear Has No Place Here. Is that what it was titled, Reverend Williams? Yeah, and so... Um, Um, and so we are um, really excited about the Wednesday night topics that we are doing. This week we're going to have the guest speaker, Emeka Inaka, and he is on his way. What have you been thinking about the Wednesday night topics thus far? Mute that, Dietrich, please. Thank you. Very informative. Good. Interesting and appropriate, okay. All right. Thought provoking. Wonderful. Wonderful. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Something exciting and different. Good, good. Mm -hmm. It was needed. Yeah, just to do something different, to have a change. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Miss Stevens? Educational. Good, good. The topics have been educational. Mimi, I'm so glad to see you. Can you take your grandson, please? Thank you. Good. I am glad to hear that the, um, the topics have been educational. They've been beneficial for you. Um, have there been, uh, Reverend Williams, um, Pastor Marla, and Reggie have been working hard to try to get topics and make sure that there are sessions that benefit every person in this church, no matter what experience you've had, no matter what age you are, no matter what your particular um, um, area of life that you're in right now, 
Um, and so we're glad to hear that those things have been speaking to you. We know that um, traditionally people are used to a Bible study on Wednesday evenings. And so that would be a change for us. But I'm glad to hear that um, you all are. Yes, it is. It's Mimi. Go with her. She wants you. Um, that, that these topics are um, speaking to where you are in life. Tell me some other topics that you would be interested in. Yeah. Reverend Williams and them, I, I hear, are planning um, the next set of things. Are there any, any areas that you would like to hear more about? Or um, I know that sometimes we've heard feedback that People wish that they had a longer, uh, had more time to spend on certain topics and they'd like to have them revisited again. It was a lot. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's a lot to digest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right, so take, so maybe have um, a, a follow-up sessions to really be able to dissect and understand more fully what was okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. So maybe take a little bit more time to, um, to be able to understand more of, uh, to follow up on certain topics. Okay. Very good. Anybody else? Our speaker is here. You know what I would like? Mm hmm I would like some more mental health. Some more mental health. Some more mental health and opioid addiction. Okay. Opioid addiction in particular. Okay. Okay. Hold on, baby. Hold on. Okay. Right, right, because it affects a lot more people than we really know. Okay. Very good. Anybody else before we? Okay. Yes. Single life. Okay. Sounds good. And Reverend Williams is making those notations. All right. Okay. Our wonderful speaker is here, and I want to introduce Emeka Inaka. He's a professional motivational speaker and leading advocate for individuals with physical challenges. He brings a message of determination, inspiration, and hope to audiences of all ages, young and old. While playing in a semi-pro football game at the age of 21, Emeka sustained a career-ending neck and spinal cord injury that left him paralyzed from his chest down. In the face of the most extreme of, ex of circumstances, he chose not to give in and not to give up. Listen intently as Emeka shares his story. The audience will have an opportunity to ask questions toward the end of our time together. Please join me in welcoming Emeka Inaka. Amen. Good evening, everyone. I hope you guys are doing all right tonight. Um, it's hot. I, I, I know that I'm good being on the inside of the air condition, so I'm already feeling better. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and I am, and Reggie, thank you for having me. Um, I am extremely happy to be here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise my chair up so that I can see all your beautiful faces because, yeah, I'm missing y'all. Um, like she said, I want, I'm going, what I want to do is I want to share a little bit about my story and 
talk a little bit about some other things uh, that I've experienced through one crazy ride. Um, I'll tell you that my, I am from Georgia by way of Washington, D.C. Um, I moved to Oklahoma in 07 uh, to go to school at Oral Roberts University. Um, when I was, uh, it was crazy, when I was younger, I was like 13, when I got in trouble, I got arrested, and my parents wanted me to just get some home training, and so they sent me home. Um, and home was Nigeria. And I thought that I was gonna go there for about two weeks, and then two weeks turned to two and a half years, and then I came back and just with a whole new view of the world, to say the least. And for the time that I came back, my mom had been talking about Oral Roberts University. And I knew nothing about, like, Oral Roberts University. Um, I had grown up, I went to, I finished my high school and then was doing some community college back in Georgia and then started looking for where I was going to go to finish my degree. And so I had applied at University of Georgia, University of Maryland, um, at University of Alabama, Troy, Savannah State, because I wanted to play football. And so when my mom was talking about, you know, I want you to apply to Oral Roberts, it was just like, uh, like that's, you know, that's, that ain't for me. That, that, that's not my school. And so she was on me, on me, on me. So I was like, all right, I'm going to apply. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to lie by my SAT scores. So I'm going to lower the SAT scores. Uh, and I'm going to not do the essays. Uh, and I'm going to wait to the very, very, the past the deadline and send my application in. Kids, don't do what I did. Like, <laughs> so I did this, and it was like August 1st. Um, I did this, it was July, it was the end of July, and then a week later, August 1st, they called me, and they tell, someone calls me, and it's the first time I've seen 918. Don't even know what the area code is. I pick up, dude, it's like, hey, congratulations, you've been accepted to Oral Roberts University. <laughs> I kid you not, I, I hang up the phone. He calls back and is like, you've been accepted to Oral Roberts University. I'm like, no, no, I think you got the wrong guy. And they're like, this is Mekinaka? And I'm like, yeah. They're like, no, nah, I'm looking at the paperwork like you've been accepted. And I'm literally on the phone like, dude, like, what are you talking about? Like, I just turned in my application last week. And he's like, dude, I don't know what to tell you. All I can say, probably God wants you here. Like, you got to be here next week. And so I was out playing some balls with friends of mine, and we went out to eat, and everybody could tell how dejected I was. And they're like, man, bro, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, man, I just got accepted into college. <laughs> Everybody's like, congratulations. I'm like, man, now you don't get it. Like, <laughs> there's no way that I'm going to be able to go home and tell my mom and my dad that Oral Roberts University has accepted me, and they not make me go out there or come out here and try it for a year. Surely enough, I go back home, I tell them, they're ecstatic, and I'm just like, dang, and here we go. So instead of them, instead of me getting a flight, they wanted to make sure that they drove me and make sure they dropped me right <laughs> off in Oklahoma. Now, I can tell you that I knew nothing about Oklahoma before I got here. Or, well, no, I knew two things about Oklahoma. I knew about the Oklahoma City bombing, and I knew about the Wizard of Oz. And then I got here... And I said those two things, and then people looked at me like, stupid. And I was like, you know, Wizard of Oz in Kansas, right? <laughs> so I know one thing about Oklahoma. I pull up, and I am now about to begin this life at Oral Roberts. I get all of my stuff moved into my room. I am lying on my bed, and all I can think is, wow, I'm about to be a monk. <laughs> and like no more rap music no more no more like I think I, I gotta be a preacher like it's just worship music and literally these are literal, literal thoughts that I had and so I would begin my career at Oral Roberts and one thing that I realized was that I just wasn't ready for school um, it didn't matter where I went like whether it was Bama, University of Georgia, like I just wasn't ready because I just wasn't in the mindset for education. And so academia was not my strong suit. Um, I was at ORU and I racked up 
a ton of expensive Fs. Like, oh, it was not going well. And so I transferred to TCC. And at TCC, I racked up a bunch of cheaper Fs. <laughs> and life was just not going the way I wanted to go. Like, my mom and my sisters and my dad would be calling and asking me, like, you know, how was school? How was everything? And it was just like, I, it's going. Like, you know, then, you know, they, so how are your grades? My, I, can't, I cannot hear you. Like, hey, call me back later. And I just avoid the phone call. And I felt like a failure at the time in the sense of like, yo, like they, there's no way that my parents would be, you know, I could only imagine my mom telling her friends that her son is in, you know, out in Oklahoma doing school. And it just, it's a false, it's false because I'm out here just failing. And then with my sisters, I'm like, I couldn't be the older brother that they were proud of. And so I'm struggling. And when I was at, if when, one thing is when I was at ORU before I left, I was working at the uh, gym, and I'm walking, I'm mopping this floor, and I accidentally bump into this guy, knock him over. Pick him back up, and he's like, man, you're huge. You should be playing football somewhere. And I'm like, I know. And he's like, yo, I got a friend that's starting a football team. You should try out. So I try out, make the team, and now it's like I've got a second chance. And we won a championship the first year, and my spirit was in a whole new level. You know, now I'm like, I got a little pep in my step. You know, mom's answering. I'm picking up on the first ring. Yo, hello? Yo, what's up? Oh, how's life? Uh, you know, I'm a champion. Like, I'm doing, my, I'm doing good. I'm in the best shape of my life. I'm living. And my, a year went by, and I got a call from a school in Missouri. And they were like, yo, you know, we've heard about you. Like, what are your thoughts about coming to play for us? Um, I was like, but my grades. They're like, we will give you a chance at school. You can, you can come here. You work on your grades. You'll play football for us. Now, if you've ever been in a place in your life where the doors of opportunity are just wide open, where there was the first time you had a child and you saw that baby, you, you're down the aisle, you know that person you're about to marry, like that feeling of, wow, like everything's about to change. That was where I was at because at this moment I had a chance to rewrite my entire history. You know, I can be a whole new person, I can do the thing that I love, and I can, you know, go to school and try to rebound. I was extremely, like, ready, excited, and I remember the day I, I put on my whitest of white tees and went to the mall, um, because the mall is where you go to when you're excited. Uh, I don't know. Um, and I'm telling all my friends, like, yo, I'm about to move to Missouri, like, this is it. All I had to do was finish out the season. Three weeks uh, later, we're in a game in Arkansas, and like anything I've done before, I go down and I make this tackle, and something doesn't feel right. And I go down, the person goes down, he stands up, and I can't stand up. And my teammates were asking me, like, yo, Mac, get up, get up. And I'm like, yo, give me a second. Like, I. I don't know, I hit my funny bone. Like I, Cause if you've ever el hit your elbow and gotten that tingly feeling in your pinky, that is what I felt over my entire body. And so I'm telling them like, give me a second, give me a second. And after a couple seconds, the trainers are running out. And I remember trying to reach up and take my helmet off and my arm, I can't move my right arm and I couldn't control my left. And I'm like, yo, what is going on? And so the trainers are out there and I can hear them screaming back and forth to each other. I think it's C5, I think it's C6. Like, stay calm. And I'm like, I'm calm. Um, and I was calm until I wasn't. Because about 10 minutes into this whole ordeal, my breathing starts to change a little bit. Because and you're familiar with football, you know, pads tightened to your chest, helmet, face mask, and I just ran down the length of a football field. And so I'm tired, and I'm trying to catch my breath. But... As I'm trying to catch my breath, all I can get is <sighs> and my 
brain isn't registering why I can't get this deep breath. Because if you've ever been in a pool and you've been underwater for a significant amount of time, the one thing you want to do when you come up is what? Breathe. You want to take that one deep breath and your body knows, all right, we're good. And I could not get that breath. It felt like there was an elephant sitting on my chest. And so while my brain is like calm, my body is freaking out because it's not getting the oxygen that it needs. And so now I'm like trying to count the breaths. Like, okay, I want this breath. And after I got to about 100, it just was nerve wracking. I couldn't keep count. I couldn't keep count. And so the, at one point, I closed my eyes to pray. And all I hear is someone screaming, Mecca, Mecca, wake up, wake up. And I'm like, I'm awake, I'm awake. And they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm praying. And they're like, well, pray with your eyes open. God can still hear you. It's like, all right, cool, I can do that. And so I'm like having this prayer and this conversation with God, like, yo, I don't know what's going on right now, but thank you. Like, I, I don't know if I should be dead right now or I should not, but I'm like, thank you for my, that I'm able to think right now. Thank you that I'm able to pray right now. Help. And long story short, ambulance gets there and they are wheeling me to the ambulance and I've watched sports my entire life. And I understand that whether, I've seen people get hurt. And whether you are walking off, crawling off, limping off, carried off, as an athlete, you do something to let the crowd know you're gonna be okay. You wave your hand, you put the thumbs up, you know, you put the fist up. And so I'm on my way to the ambulance and I'm like, I gotta let them know I'm all right. And I go to reach up and I can't move anything. I can't move my thumb, I can't move my hand, I can't move anything. And as they wheel me in, I just remember having this thought, like, yo, is everything gonna be okay? I would get to the hospital um, where they would, you know, drill everything, drill my helmet off, cut my pads off, cut my socks off. And I would undergo, um, they chill my spine that night, um, and that's when they let me know that C5, C6 is the level in which I had just broken my neck. Um, they would chill my spine down, and the next day I went in for a nine-hour neck surgery, and they put in a cage from C4 to C8. If you touch the back of your neck and at the base of your neck, the bone that's sticking out, that is C7. Uh, so just to give you an idea, I broke my neck about two spots above that, and they put in a cage about three spots above that down to one spot below it. And so I'm in Arkansas, and... I have this surgery, and I remember being in there just not knowing what was going on, really. And just my very first therapeutic move was like laying on my side and flexing my wrist, just like this. And I remember uh, the therapist at the time telling me like, yo, like this is gonna be a journey. And you know, I'm I'm 21 years old. And so, you know, at 21, I'm Superman. Like, journey, all right, whatever. So 10 days goes by, they bring me back to Tulsa, and I would begin the process of rehabilitation. So I'm at one place stabilizing, and you, I would honestly, I would tell you that by my demeanor in the hospital, you would not have known, like, that I was going through something super significant or crazy because I tried to keep, the level up, like, like, let's have a good time. You know, so I'm flirting with my nurses. I'm sneaking my dogs in. Like, it's just a, they, I was a handful at this hospital. Like, I, I, there were people that would sneak over from the other wings because they're like, yo, we got to see what is going on over here. So by the time I got back, the news had ran the story. So I've got strangers that were visiting me at the hospital. Um, I got people that I've met once that were coming in to just give, you know, positive vibes. And so the time there was like, it was great. You know, I felt like I had a lot of support. And in my mind, I'm like, you know, we're going to approach this like we did football. I'm wake up, therapy, rest, therapy, sleep, wake up, repeat. And I did this because I knew that, 
you know, when I got out of this hospital, I was going to walk out of here. And so one month goes by, two months goes by, three months goes by, four months goes by, and his doctor comes into my hospital room and tells me that, you know, they've done everything they can do and that they're drawing up my discharge papers. And for the first time in my entire life, nothing made sense because, like I just said, I'm supposed to walk out of this hospital. And so you're telling me that the hospital has done everything I can do. When I look at my body, I don't feel better. When I look, I don't look better. If you've been to the hospital before or your doctor's office, there is a moral, not even a moral conscience, like there's an expectation like between you and the establishment because I'm broke, I'm broken, you're going to fix me. I am hurt, you're going to heal me. That is what I came for. And so for you, me to be in this place, and you telling me that you've done everything you can do for me, no, no, that don't, that don't make sense to me. Like that's like me showing up to Chick-fil-A and they'd be like, we ran out of chicken. Like that, that, that just don't make no sense. And so I would go home, you know, they would release me back to my life. But yet this ain't the life that I've lived for 21 years. You know, I am now would begin pretty much the darkest seven, 10 months of my entire life because I'm in a place of, I mean, hard is, I can't, like there's not words to describe what it felt like to feel like I was dying a slow death. You know, because at this point, while I was in the hospital, I put my life that I was living on the shelf. And my expectation was I was going to come back and pick it right back up. I literally watched the life that I lived expire and die on the shelf. Because here I am trying to wrap my brain around the fact that I'm not playing football anymore. And not even just that, it's adjusting to everything happening around me. And people like under, people don't know, people don't know what they don't know, but people don't really understand what going through something like this actually entails because people just think that I have, I'm adjusting to you know, using a wheelchair. But it's so much more than that. It's, I'm adjusting to the way my family views me. I'm adjusting to the, you know, my space as a brother, as an older brother. Um, I'm adjusting to my world as with my friends. Um, adjusting to the expectations, um, how the world views me, how I view the world. And we're talking about having all of that put on top of me with all of this. It felt like ground zero at like the World Trade Center. Like, it's not just the building that comes down. It's debris that affects everyone else in my immediate vicinity. So my family, my friends, everyone that's close to me is affected because now, you know, I'm having to deal with anger and I'm having to deal with sadness, depression. I'm having to deal with not knowing what to do and how to piece my life back together. And so now I'm taking it out on people because you know, you hurt the people that are closest to you um, and trying to figure out how am I supposed to navigate this new world? And then not to mention, where's God in all of this? And I'm trying, you know, I'm trying not to ask that critical question that most people will ask when you're going through something hard. You know what? I, you know, after, you know, you know, the month one, I'm like, I'm not going to ask God. I'm not going to ask God. You know what? I'm just going to trust the process. Like, and so I'm at doing therapy. And while I'm at therapy, I'm all smiles. And then when I go home, is the question of like, you know, who, will I, who am I going to be today? Like, who, who, what, is, what am I going to do with this life? Go to therapy, all smiles, try to do some work, come back home. Will I ever get married? All smiles, come back home. 
Will I ever support my family? Will I ever make them proud? Will I ever, will my life mean something? And one month, two months, three months, I can remember the day in which I, my phone did not ring. Not a no Facebook notification, not a tweet, not a text, not a call, nothing. And dealing, grappling with this question of, does my life matter to anyone? Now, I know that at that time, now I can know, looking back, it's an irrational question. It was one of those like weird, everything aligned, people were busy, you know, just weird. But at that, it's a very real emotion at that time, like, yo, my life doesn't matter to anybody. Why am I even here? What can I even do? And seven months comes by and I am really just trying to, I'm just in a whirlwind. I, I don't know what to do with this life. And a friend of mine asked me to come and volunteer at uh, the church um, at Victory. He, was a, he worked with the youth and so he's like, hey, come up to the office and hang out with me. And so I go. And it was good to get out of, like, my own head. Because I think in between your ears the most, some of, can be the most dangerous place. And especially when you feel isolated. Because when you're experiencing pain and you not, you're not talking about that pain and you're not bouncing that pain off of other people, your mind will go negative. You know, our... Our, our natural inclination is to be negative. Um, because let's say you're at home, right? And you're waiting for whoever that lives at home to come home at a certain time. And let's say they're like an hour late. Your first thought is not going to be, oh, I, w- I bet they went to go get dinner and that's why they are late. Your first thought is what happened? You know, you're calling because we are, you know, this world injects us with fear. And so when we get squeezed or when we, you know, under pressure, fear comes out. And here I am in this place where I'm extremely fearful and it's hard for me to talk. And then I would, then I got out and started volunteering with this youth group. Now, I was already dealing with my own insecurities about everything. I did not know how to, I did not know my space in my new world. And so now I'm at this uh, youth group and it's like 300 kids and man, how many of us know the kids say the darndest things? Don't go, one, youth ministry is not for the faint of heart, but if you try to protect your little feelings, don't, don't, don't go talk to some kids. So I'm, here I am in this youth group and I, I remember the first night that they asked me, like, oh, yo, just come and, you know, hang out. And I love people, but my ego took a huge hit. Like, I'm 6'5", and now I'm sitting at 4'5", and now I got kids walking all around me. And I'm trying to move, and it's like, oh, I'm sorry, is that your foot? Like, oh, my bad, your foot? Like, dang, I, I just don't know how to use this thing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then I, because I'm, you know, still trying to deal with my own questions, kids would start asking me questions. Hey man, like, what's that? What's what? That car. What car? That thing you're sitting in. Oh, this? Oh, it's a wheelchair. Why do you got to use that? Because um, uh, I wasn't comfortable in, in sharing my own story. Because I hadn't embraced it. You know, I, I, when I tell you guys, there was a significant amount of time where the world paralyzed, would paralyze me. I would not like to say it. When I was sitting in church and they would, like, I'd hear, like, the sermon kind of going toward the, you know, the, the parable of the paralyzed man. They started using the word paralyzed. It felt like it just, uh, it just did not feel good. Um... And kids would start asking, you know, so what's wrong with your hands? You know, why, why did you get yourself hurt? Do you like your life? What do you want to do? Can you give me a ride? 
<laughs> like all the questions. And in the beginning, I wasn't, I didn't know how to answer them. But soon enough, like they would ask me questions that made me go home and ask myself those same hard questions. And I think for the most part, life is going to force you into asking some hard questions. And the work that I do now with people, I've learned that it's not the hard questions that hold people back. It's the hard answers that they're not ready to face. And there were some hard answers that I had to face. Like, there was a time that even looking in the mirror, I did not like the person that I saw. And so it's a whole new level of loneliness when there are not people around you and you don't like the person that you're looking at in the mirror. And the reason that this time there wasn't anyone around me is because at the time of my accident, everyone's life stopped. My friends, my family, my teammates, strangers, everyone's life stopped. But after four months, people got to go back to work, people got to go back to school, people got to go back to living life. And here I am stuck on stop. And dealing with that now, trying to figure out how do I move forward. And so when I started volunteering at this youth group, you know, one day turned to two days, turned to three days, these kids just started asking me questions, and then I started to, you know, answer back, and they'd be like, oh, like, I guess I have something in the tank, you know. Kids, you know, it started to give me a little bit of purpose because it was like, okay, this life that I'm living is not over. So then I started to do a small group um, of boys, and we just talked about Proverbs and wisdom because Lord knows, I, ain't, I, I mean, I, I was so insecure in my, own, in my own identity with Christ that I only could talk about my worldly experiences. I couldn't give them meat. Um, but I was, you know, at, I do believe, if I, had a, I wish I could have, I had a cup. I believe that, imagine a cup that has some water, a little bit of water in it. I believe that that is the experiences that we've lived in this world. And I believe that everyone has something to give to another person. But when you begin to pour out of yourself, out of your experiences, you're going to realize just how empty you are and the only person that can fill that cup is, our, you know, is God. And so I went back to um, Bible school. And I was like, you know what, I need to get this cup full because, you know, they say, you know, Jesus himself was like, no, 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 I need to fill myself. I'll let y'all get the overflow. And so I didn't know how empty I had been. And so I went back to, you know, back to Bible college. And then I started paying attention to uh, church. I started to read my Bible again. And surely, slowly but surely, something started to happen. Like, I started to get a new zeal for life. And I started to get this new feeling of love that I didn't think that I was going to get back again. Because, you know, from the time I picked up a football, that was like my first love. You know what I mean? And then having it taken away from me, that was like the worst breakup I've ever, I've ever been through. And so then, now I'm starting to get these new butterfly feelings for these kids, and it's like, can I, is, it, is this happening? Do I, can I like somebody again? Like, can I like this life? And so I just started to dive deep with kids, one step after the other, and decided to take a, really what happened for me was that I had this realization that the circle, it, where I was struggling at was the fact that I was holding on to a life that was. And because I was holding on to a life that was, I could not embrace the life that is. And when you're not present with where you are, how can you, how can you create a life that could be? Because if you don't know where you are, how do you know where you're going? And so uh, someone asked me, you know, was it hard relearning how to do things? opening up water bottles, washing my face, driving, things like that. And I remember just like sitting with that question. I remember thinking like, yeah, it was extremely hard. But it wasn't nearly as hard as letting go of the way that I used to do them. And then I realized that the power was in letting go. 
because I do believe it is not the circumstances of our lives that are our true problems. It is the circumstances of our lives against the backdrop of the way we think our lives are supposed to be. I've got plenty of friends who, you know, and I'll just say my, like a lot of girlfriends who are like 30 and single and they're like super depressed with their life. I'm like, why? Like, why are you depressed? And it really, they're depressed because they bought into this idea that, you know, I was supposed to be married at 22, baby at 24, happily single, or married and happily ever after at 29. And it's like, but that's not where you are. Like, you are where you are. That's just it. Like, embrace it. And I will tell you guys this. After seven months, I broke down and I did ask God why. And God is, 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 sometimes you get an answer right then and there. Sometimes it comes a little bit later, but, you know, sometimes you get that answer. It's not the answer that you were really expecting. So I was like, I had a moment where I was like, God, why, why did this happen to me? Because there was a real, there were nights that I was up at two o'clock in the morning trying to think about every good thing I've ever done. And then thinking about every bad thing I've ever done. And then like, I got, like I did the math. I'm on the positive side, like, so, like, if you could, I'd like to wake up tomorrow on my feet. Like, and there was a time there where, you know, I was praying really hard for healing. And I think, I'm going to say this, I was praying really hard for healing and listening to all of the prophets and listening, to, reading all of the verses. And then I would wake up, and every day that I wake up and i not on my feet, every day felt like a loss. Like I started the day with an L, and it was like a real dark time in my life. And it wasn't until I let go of the expectations um, of that, because when I asked God why, the response that I got back was, like, why are you asking me why? Like, if you ask me why did you get hurt, there's like a million whys out there. Like, so why does, you know, a parent bury a child? Why do people go with natural disasters? Why are, you know, why are people abused? Why are people evil? Like, there's so many different whys that I can ask out there. And then, like, I literally heard, like, you should be asking how. I was like, what, how, what? You know, how are you going to use this? And I tell you, that shift changed everything. Because up until that point, my accident was something that happened to me. It was a place that I kind of just balled up and was like a victim of life. I was in, you know, it felt like I was being kidnapped by life. Like, like life had bound me up, threw me in the trunk, and I had no control. And then I started to ask the how question, and the how question changed everything because it put the ball in my court, and it was just like, yo, what you gonna do? Like, and it was God almost like, I never, I have never left you. Like, I am right here. Anybody working out, I work out, and so, I, you know, be on a bench press. And when you're doing bench press, you need a spotter. And basically, the weight of life was just on my chest, just sitting there. And God is like, yo, I'm here trying to help you spot this. You just haven't tried to push the weight off. And so once I started trying to, you know, to push the weight, it was like, oh, you are with me. Like, oh, I'm getting a little bit stronger. Like, let me... Let me work with these kids. Let me try to go back to school. And I'll tell you what, like, things began to change. And there wasn't this shame associated with my accident. Because, again, with, when we read the Bible, there are sometimes people will, people will come up to me and pray, and they'd be like, yo, just, you know, <laughs> go and sin no more and, you, and you, you, you'll be alright <laughs> I'm like okay 
Thanks. Uh, like, your faith is not strong enough. Like, why, why, like, let go of the faith. And I'm like, like, all uh, right, like, so you think that I don't want to stand up? Like, you think I'm just holding myself back? I, and there was a time where I stopped going to the altar, people. Like, let, let me tell you, because I would come down and, you know, I'm listening to this great sermon about finances. I'm like, you know what? God, you could bless my pockets. Let me go down there and get some prayer. And close my eyes, and then I'm praying, and then it feels stuffy, like, man, there's people, like, a lot of people down here. And then, like, then you just feel like people just breathing your air, and then I, like, open my eye, like, and there are people standing all around me praying for my legs, praying on the back of my I'm like, yo, same way, this ain't why I'm here, y'all. Like, this, like, like, I don't need this right now. And, man, I'll tell you, so I'll have muscle spasms where my leg will just shake. Can you imagine being in church? Somebody praying for me, and all of a sudden I have a muscle spasm. Oh my God! They praying harder, and I'm like, nah, like, I'm trying to, like, now, now I got to figure out, am I going to, like, obliterate their faith? Like, actually, hey, uh, now what you think, now what you think. But these are the things that would happen that felt, like, embarrassing. And then it, it, it'd be, like, this shame that would come over me, like, yo, is my faith good? Am I not doing the right thing? Um, until I let go, and I let go of the outcome. Like, because one thing that I did hear was, like, God asked, like, it was like, if I healed you right here, right now, would you go back to the life that you were living before you got hurt? And that was a real question I had to deal with. And there was, like, at the time, I could not answer that question. Like, I was like, yo, like, actually, if I'm honest, honest, probably going back. Like, I, like, I can't even lie, probably going back. Um, and so I just spent more time, you know, personal development, spent more time dealing with my own mental health, and spent more time dealing with God's people. And as I went back to school, um, just life began to pick up. And I think people were drawn to me because I just lived, like, God called us to live abundant lives, not like, and he never said that life is going to be easy. And this is my own, I guess, cross to bear. We all got our cross to bear, like, and we all carrying our own cross. And I just think that so many people, like, give up in life. And life is, it's like a boxing match, right? Like, I think you're in the ring and life is going to throw punches. And I think for the most part, we think that, you know, life throws one punch, and that's supposed to be it. And it's like, nah, like, it's going, life's going to throw multiple punches. And when I say multiple punches, I'm talking about multiple haymakers. And a lot of people have taken some big hits and have just balled up. And they're waiting for the ref to call the fight. But there is no ref. Like, there is no ref to call the fight. Like, if you don't get up and fight back, the only option is death. And so I took some punches, and I was on the mat for a while, and I decided, you know what? Now I'm going to get back up and throw some punches of my own. So I went back to school, and I got my undergrad degree, and then I got my master's degree. And so now I work as a counselor. I got my master's degree in counseling uh, because what better way to help others than to, you know, I understand the deep darkness of mental health, and, and it's normal you know like it's we all experience sadness because life is not easy and as a black man i know that there's a stigma associated with like getting help like are you crazy no i'm not crazy i just had some issues and i want to talk to somebody about it um and so now as a counselor i work with kids and i just came from my job where i get to just be the person that a kid can talk to i get to be that um, sounding golf board because I know what, again, what pain makes us do. Pain makes us hide and pain makes us think that we're the only person that's ever experienced whatever it is that we're going through. But news flashes, you are not unique. <laughs> You're uniquely ununique. 
Like, you've been lonely before, other people have experienced loneliness before. You've been sad before, mad before, other people have experienced sadness and madness. And the greatest thing is that other people have overcome it too. Like, I think so much we, so many times we're like, I'm just going to give it to God. But a part of giving it to God is also like, I, me, to go back to the weight reference, it's like a spotter is not there to just pick the weight off for you. Like, you got to push it and then they help you. And so many times I think we're asking God to just rescue me from this situation. And God's like, I'm here so you can rescue you. I'm, I'm here to, to help you. And I have learned, I've got it, like, the beautiful thing about darkness, and I did say that correctly, the beautiful thing about darkness is that for the most part we think that, you know, there's a boogeyman in the room. <laughs> So then we forget that, that book, there's no boogeyman, it's just God just sitting there, like, chilling, waiting for you. And we get so afraid of the things that we don't see, and we forget that we, sometimes we just got to trust and just take a step. Like, I promise you, I felt lost, bewildered. I had no idea where I was, but I knew that I didn't want to be here. So I just took a step in any direction. And as one step turned to two, God was like, all right, there you go. Keep moving. Keep moving. Because think about it. If you're driving down the road and you see someone standing on the side of the road with their thumb out, you're probably going to drive by. I know your heart. You're probably going to drive by. But I know for a fact, too, that when we, if you drive and you saw someone trying to push their car, like, you're going to jump out. Like, people jump out and help people that are helping themselves. Sometimes we're trying to get, we're just on the side of the road like, yo, somebody help me. And it's like, no, no, get the ball rolling. Like, just do some work. And people will, God, people, people will come and help you. Um, also, something I want to do, man, like, now I'm just kind of just spitting. So I will open this up. For, I can do questions, right? Do me a favor. Y'all start thinking about some questions. You can't, there's nothing that you can't ask me because, again, I work with kids. Don't be that person that, don't, don't, don't have a question that you would want to ask and then you leave here and be like, dang, I should have asked that question. Because, yeah, don't be that person. But, yeah, go ahead. We'll, we'll open the questions now. Go ahead. I'm just, that's my story. All right. Anybody have a question? See, there you go. There y'all go tri tripping. I wrote a little note here and I says, um, you said, what am I going to do with this life? And then I wondered, had you not have found those children, what would you have done? Would you have said, this is the end, I'm through, I'm out of here? Well, so I'm not built in a way to quit. And I do believe that all life requires you to do is hold on. Mm -hmm. and something will break through because when I found it's not even like I found those kids because I wasn't looking for them they found me and so many times it's just like you just got to hold on and like what's for you will come to you um, I think so many again it's, it's we get so locked in and again our society is real big on I want it now let me get it and so many times we're not even ready for what we want. We're praying for things that God is like, ooh, you're not even seasoned yet. Like, like you want to do, you really, you want to do that? Um, and so I would not have given up. Like, I just, because I know God was with me, um, and I got to that realization that, like, whatever this life amounts to, I just had to give it up and trust. And that, that's the hardest thing about faith is like, I don't know what's behind door number one, two, or three, mm -hmm. but I'm about to uh, yeah. and just hope that nothing, uh, hope I don't die. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just it, like just taking a leap of faith. Mm -hmm. What's up, man? Uh, 
Oh, no, 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 no. Look, look, look. When I tell you that school was not for me in that time, whoo, look, they wouldn't even have taken me back. Let's just, let's just, let's just leave it at that. <laughs> Good questions. So, again, I did not go back to ORU. I, I thought about it and I went. I was just like, yo, there's, when some relationships end, you just don't go back. <laughs> you just <laughs> charge that one to the game. ORU got me to Oklahoma. That, it served its purpose. I ended up getting my undergrad at Langston, and then I got my, yeah. And then I got my master's at uh, OU. Um, And that too was like, I wasn't looking for school. Um, a dr uh, I was riding the bus and a driver asked me what I wanted to do with my life. And I said, I don't know, I've been doing these small groups. I should, he said, like, have you ever thought about doing being a speaker? And gave me the contact of a um, professor at Langston. He told me, give him a call. I didn't give him a call. The guy picked me up again. He was like, hey man, did you call my guy? I said, like, ah, man, I'm going to call him today. I didn't do it. The third time he asked me, I was like, bro, like, if you come pick me up and I did not call him, just leave me. <laughs> I called, set up a meeting, went. We talked. I had just missed the speaking thing that he wanted me to do. And then had I called him the first time, I wouldn't have missed it. So right before I leave, he was just like, what are your plans for school? I was like, I have none. And he said, yo, we would love for you to come and, you know, we will scholarship you for a year. And when, you know, God will provide pathways. And sometimes when those doors open, it's just left for you to walk through. So I went, started back at school. Hardest thing I've done because, again, school, not my thing. Failed college algebra three times, failed English three times, failed humanities three times. Don't know why three is my number. But first time I went back to school, guess what three classes were right there waiting for me? Oh, difficult. And, but it was different because now I've like, I know that, yo, it's not playtime. Like, this is real. And so uh, how I did my schoolwork, my iPad and my phone were my two best friends. So I did all the typing on my iPad. I've spent time at the library. I spent time with teachers. I did the pa papers were my hardest. Oh, I hate writing papers. Like, and I don't like reading. And so I would write papers and not read the papers. Just trust, like faith, God, hey, do something with this. <laughs> and kept my head down and one step after the other, by the time I looked up, they were like, yo, you're almost done with your undergrad, you know? And it was crazy because when the master's degree came up, I just really wasn't even thinking like, yo, master's degree, really? You wanna do that? And I'm at, here I am at what, 20, I was 27 when I started the master's degree. And I'm thinking to myself, what would you know, me talking to 19-year-old self be like? And 19-year-old self like, who are you? And 27-year-old self like, hey, we about to be somebody new. Like, we doing this thing. And surely enough, three years after that, the one running thought in my head that I just kept telling myself was, the time is going to pass anyway. So do you want to be 30 with a degree or 30 without it? Like, do it. Just Get it done. Um, and I'm even contemplating a PhD run in the spring next year. It's crazy. But I did realize that there's nothing holding me back. Like, I, I'm smart. Like, and if I'm not smart, I can get smart. Like, I'm more, I'm more human smart versus like book smart. But so I get around people that are book smart and just feed off the human aspect of it. I just got to find my ways to, you got to find ways to win, man. You got to just find ways to win. Now, coming to grips with the 
healed part. The biggest question that I, the answer that I got was, why do I associate healing with the physical thing? And at some point, it was one of those things where I realized that, yo, I am healed emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Like, I, I think the church needs to do a better job of talking about all or nothing faith, right? Because I do think that we, it's one of those things we're discussing, when we discuss faith, it's like, man, you got to be all in. Um, because if you're not all in, like, you got to be all in with faith. You got to just jump. And, like, and that is what faith is. But I do believe that when it comes with God, it's like you have to almost recognize that, like, even if I have nothing, I still have it all. Like, even if I see nothing, I still have it all. So it's not all or nothing. It's all, it's nothing is all. Like, I, like, I got God, and that's all I need. So I think, yeah, I think we, we should do more with, like, knowing that even if I'm praying for X, Y, Z, if X, Y, Z don't happen, I'm good. Like, and that is a hard place to be for people because, again, for me, it was like, oh, my life is going to be better when I'm back on my feet. And when I was thinking like that, again, every day I started with the loss. When I began to realize, like, yo, my life is better just as it is, then life became better. You're here, you're teaching us, and we're getting some good stuff. And it seems like that you're healed and whole and better. But how do you, or do you have anger that you have to deal with from time to time? And how do you go about that? And how would you suggest that if someone is going through their whatever, and they have anger built up, whether they know it or not, but how do you get through that thing? Because we come to church sometimes, we say glory, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and we go through all of these things, and sometimes we're bubbling on the inside and about to explode. So that whole anger, peace, and even as the Lord has blessed you today and where you are, do you deal with it? Do you struggle with it? How do you deal with it? And then how do, what words of do you have for other people that might have this silent frustration that's going on? Good, great question. So I believe that we are all like these little, it's almost like clocks. Like we, we there's things that our experiences are, how we're wired, they make us react a certain way. So like the way our brain works is like a highway. So if you you know, if someone says something to you, it's easy to get off on this off ramp because your brain is so used to going that direction. You're driving somewhere, you don't even have to think about how to get there because it's just so you, muscle memory. I was a very angry kid growing up. I had a temper that went unchecked, trigger happy. Like I could just get upset at the smallest of things. And then this happened and it was bottle like it just would sit right here and I would that was something that I really had to deal with and I kept asking myself who what am I mad at who am I mad at and for me my biggest thing is I think I was mad I was more mad at myself more than anything and I had to forgive myself because that was a hard thing because what happens is that, you know, you, you're carrying anger in you. Like, if I brought an orange up here and squeezed an orange, apple juice is not coming out. Orange juice is coming out. And so if you're squeezed and anger comes out, that is already in you. Like, so-and-so didn't make you angry. They just squeezed you and the anger that you had already came out. And so I had to pray and deal with like, yo, why do I have this anger in me? What is causing this? And 
there were a lot of different things that happened in my life that I knew that I was angry about. I, I was angry that my mom and my dad sent me to Nigeria. I was angry that they wanted me to go to ORU. I was angry that my sister ate my last cookie when I was five. Like, there was a lot of things that made me angry. So it's kind of just going, like, I was playing these things in my mind and asking myself, is it worth it to me to hold on to it? Because anger is like me squeezing a, a piece of broken glass. Like, I'm, am I going to hold on to resentment? Like, and that resentment is a huge thing. Because I feel like most anger comes from resentment because we don't, like, something happens and you don't say something, like, you don't say that it bothered you, and now you resent someone for something that they don't even know they did. And I had to deal with um, a person that hurt me very dearly. And I never said anything about it. And it was one of those things where it's like, if you're going to forgive, then you have to, like, let it go. Letting go, huge, hard, but huge. Um, and I remember this guy, he was my roommate, and he just was not there for me after my accident. And then I saw that he had gotten married to a girl that I introduced him to. And I remember being so mad in my room seeing it, like pushing my computer off my lap. And I asked myself, is that the person that you want to be? Like mad, like mad at love? Like, you love love. How are you going to hate on love? And I prayed and I asked God, yo, let me, like, help me release this thing. And again, God was like, I'm not holding it. Like, you holding it. Like, release it. And I, I promise you that I sat there just like, I'm letting it go. I'm letting it go. I am letting it go. A week later, I'm at Walmart. And I see these two people. And it's one of those things where, like, you pray for patience, you're going to get tested. I prayed to let go of anger, and a moment right there was, it was there to, you're going to forgive or forget. You're going to let it go, or you're going to hold on to it. And I avoided them. <laughs> I ran, easy, quick, went down the other aisle. Went, got my stuff, went to... Uh, check out and was on my way out. I totally took the easy way out. And I was on my way out, then I heard, hey Mecca. <laughs> God. They came up, they talked, and they were like, hey, how are you? And I'm having this conversation with them, but I'm also having a conversation with me. It's like, y'all don't care. I'm good. Um, where are you living at? Like, I'm right here oh, man, Mac, we're going to come and visit you. And I was just like, you know what? You good. I, like, I was like, oh, I mean, look, I, I appreciate it. Like, I thank you guys. Um, I am here. Like, you know, I hope, I wish you the best. And I prayed for them leaving. And as we left, I felt that's probably, that is the biggest weight that I've ever lifted, ever. And like, not even, like I'm talking about like, this was, this was something, but I think forgiveness and like letting something like that go and to where I don't need, I don't need something from you to forgive you. Like, because forgiving you is a condition of my heart, not yours. And once, that concept became a thing, then letting go of the other anger, the things that I was angry for, like that was more heart surgery for me. Like, and that was heart surgery that I knew that I was capable of working on. Like, and, and it's not overnight. Like, again, there's people that have wronged me and hurt me, and it was just like, all right, this is the next thing up. How does this make me feel, and why does it make me feel that? It, do I, it's something that I need to say, and then also asking myself, does what I say need to be heard? Because there's two different things. Like, you can say, you can want to, like, tell this person why they did this, what they did, but is it really helping them, or is it helping, like, who, who is it for? And you have to be honest with yourself. One thing I would like to say about emotions, too, is that at the place that I'm at now, 
I do, like, I have a dance with life, and it's very, very, it helps me in everyday life. Anyone here ever been to the beach? Yeah, I, like, I, like, I'm not a beach guy either, but I imagine a beach being, like, when I see people standing on the sand, right there where the water is at, sand is in between their toes, the water comes, moves that sand all in between their feet, what happens to the water? What? Goes right back, right? To me, that is the way I treat emotions. Like, I feel anger. I feel it. I don't run from it. I don't hide from it. I don't say that it's not, that it's not anything that it is. Like, yep, I'm mad. <laughs> I feel it. But then I let it go. Because one thing is that if you let, if you do not let it go, you will you will be tossed and turned by the waves of emotions and you won't know what's up and what's down. And before you know it, you're reacting or responding and doing things that you wouldn't do had you just let it go. Like, but the biggest part and as a counselor in me is saying is like, it's feeling it because we get sad and then we don't want to, we want to pretend like we're not sad. We get mad and then we want to pretend like we're not mad. And then we get even madder because like, oh, I'm mad at you, but I didn't tell you why I'm mad. And then you keep doing what you're doing. And now I'm mad at you. And now I'm mad at me for not talking to you. And, then, and now I'm just bubbling up. Mm. Dealing with your emotions is having an honest conversation with yourself and then letting it go. I could have just answered that with that, but I like talking, so. I had a, a good friend that was, was paralyzed from the waist down, chest down, and he, uh, we thought he was doing great, but he took his own life. Did you, did you ever get the pretty low, that low? So, I can't say that the thought didn't come in. Um, because in that seven months, when I say darkness, we're talking about like triple darkness, like almost not seeing a way out. And the hardest part is because you feel alone. What I was lucky to have is that there were enough people that checked in, you know, and it wasn't like an everyday check in, but it was one of those things where it's like, like the lights are getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and it'd be a friend of mine like, oh, yo, Mech, what's going on? And it'd be like, all right, a flicker. And it kept you going until the next flicker. And that's why it's important for you to check in on people. Because like I said, pain makes us feel like we're the only other people ever going through pain. And that's why like suicide is the hardest thing for me because how is it, like a person has gotten to a place where they feel like, no one cares. No one is there. Um, one of the most powerful stories I ever heard was a guy that he went to go take his life and jumped off uh, San Francisco Bridge. And he lived, broke every bone in his body. But he said that his, he went his entire day and the note that he left behind, so he said he went, he woke up, he went to the store. He went back at home and then took his car to the bridge and sat out on the bridge for hours, like waving at cars. And then he jumped. And the note that he left behind said, if one person smiled at me today, I wouldn't have jumped. Hmm. He lived and said that after he jumped, he regret like, like he didn't, like he did not, he regretted it. And had a new chance at life or whatnot. But you, when I tell that story to people, I tell it in a sense of understanding the power that a smile has, the power that a compliment has, because we have no idea the demons and the darkness that people are walking through every single day that just needs some encouragement. And we, every single one of us has the power to effectively change 
the course of someone's life. I am here today because I have been the beneficiary of people that believed in me when I lost all faith in myself. I didn't believe in my life and people were like, yo, you, you, you can do something. And then the, again, I was very fortunate because I found kids who after a while when I didn't show up, they were that, like, hey, Mr. Mecca, where are you? Are you coming, are you coming in today? Like, oh man, like, I, you know, my life doesn't matter. Like if there are people in your life that, you know, are going through something and they just dropped off the face of the earth, people don't know how to ask for help. So you got to go to them. Like, and sometimes it's pain overwhelms us because we don't, again, I don't even know what to ask for. Do you, it was extremely difficult going from a place of like independence where I could, you know, I was the captain of my own um, life to where I have to ask people to chop my food up for me, fix my foot, um, reach and grab this phone. Like the most frustrating things for me were when I would drop my phone, it'd be in my vicinity, but I couldn't grab it. And people just were there. And then so surely enough, like I, someone told me, I, had to, like, I remember having to learn how to ask, how to ask for help because like there was this thing called quad syndrome. So I'm a quadriplegic. And it was because like when I would ask people now to do things, like I've stopped asking and started telling because I viewed people as an extension of my hand. And I don't ask my hand, hey, grab my phone, Just do it. And so now I was relying on people like, hey, give me that. Hey, do this. Hey, do that. And I was like, ooh, like I'm kind of bossy. Like I got to, <laughs> that's not a good look. Like I need you. So I can't, I can't like, if you, if you leave me, then I'm out of luck. Like, so it learning how to ask for help. Um, and if I'm a, I'm, I have benefited from just being able to need people and even being able to communicate. I've learned how to communicate just from that because when I ask you to flip something, um, flipping <laughs> might mean twisting to you. Um, and that was frustrating in itself. Also, there is that exercise that I want to do before we leave here. So you let me know when I got five minutes left. It's oh, it's time? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Would you guys mind doing me a favor? I did, the last thing that I, wanted, I do want to share with you is a moment uh, that really, something that really made the difference for me. Can we all go back there and stand in a circle? Let's go back here. Y'all just follow the sound of my voice. <laughs> if I had a skateboard, I'd let y'all ride behind me. Oh, you good? No, 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 you good. Let's see. I need us to get in a little bit closer. A little bit closer. All right, would you mind getting that rope out for me? Unravel that thing. And then start it right there and then like make it go around in a circle. Let everybody grab. So I might need y'all to bring it in a little bit closer. We won't need that big of a circle. Come on in a little. Act like you like each other. Come on in. Yeah, I think everybody done put in on some deodorant. All right, well, for the sake, let's just pretend like this rope goes all the way around. All right? So I did not anticipate how large this group is. So 
I, let me see, where are we at? So when I was going through the darkest moments of my life, me and my mom had this resounding, like, cry, um, or this resounding, like, pledge. She'd always be like, don't give up because there's someone that's holding onto your rope. And it was funny because I told her this sermon that I had heard. It was the last sermon Oral Roberts preached at Victory before he passed away. And it was like, it was someone's holding onto your rope. And so I use this rope because it was like, man, mom, like, what, what are you saying? Like, don't give up. Someone's holding onto your rope. Someone is holding onto your rope. Someone is holding onto your rope because the rope is hope and the rope is your life and your life you know, is a light for someone else that is going through a dark time. And this rope is pretty much measured out to about 100 feet. And so let's start here and say that, you know, I'm born, and I'm a toddler, and then I'm a teenager, and right here at 21 years old, I get hurt. And if I gave up here at 21, I wouldn't be able to meet the people's lives that I would meet here at 31. Or, yeah, I will call this 31. Hey, 31. <laughs> beautiful 31. This is where I'm at. This is where I'm at right now. And look how many other lives that are left on my rope that are depending on me to get through the little bitty struggles of the day. Like, what, what is, so one thing is that I think one, our biggest problem is we lack perspective because we think that things are bigger than what they are. Um, how many of you guys drive? Yeah, a lot of people. I am, what's your name, man? Josiah, you drive? Dang it, of all the people. You drive, all right, what kind of car you drive? You drive Malibu, Malibu is my first car. All right, what all, the, you work? Okay, okay, we'll say it like this. Let me ask you this question. If you woke up in the morning and you went out to your car and you were driving to wherever you're going to first meeting a day, and yo, you had a blowout. Boom, tire gone. Would that be a problem? That's a problem, right? Like, you done missed your meetings. You got to go get your tire fixed. Crazy, right? So let's fast forward to the end of the day. And I'm asking you, tell me about your day. It's a pretty, like, if you were telling me about your day, would, the tire come, would that tire come up? Yeah, right? Because it's the first thing. Like, yo, I had this blowout. Like, I missed this date with this girl. I'm sorry, I'm just putting you out there. Like, I'm just, <laughs> uh, like, this thing sucks. But how old are you? 18. And so in, the, in that day, that tire is a big problem, right? So let's fast forward to the end of your life. And I ask you, tell me about your life. Is a flat tire going to come up? No, not at all, right? And that is because a problem within the scope of a day can seem like a huge problem. But a problem within the scope of life, it really is no problem. And so I found myself in a place where I'm thinking about my rope and I'm thinking about my life. And I'm thinking about you know, this thing that I'm going through. And I'm asking myself, is this a flat tire? Because is this really a thing that is going to affect like the mission and vision that I have for my life. And I decided that it wasn't going to be that. Like this is just a flat tire. And so I keep everything in perspective. I always remember my rope and I always keep an eye not on just the people that are holding on to my rope where I'm at, but also the people that are depending on me to get through what I'm going through that are holding it at a place that I'm not even thinking about yet because 10 years ago on that football field 
I had no idea that I would be here today talking to you all. But I wouldn't be here today had I gave up 10 years ago. I wouldn't be here had I gave up yesterday. But there are people that I haven't even met 10 years from now that are depending on me to, fig- to even get through the hard things I'm going through today. And so we don't stop going through stuff, right? And oh, last story. I got to tell you all this. Last thing is like, I know, like, again, like I said, life is going to throw haymakers. So I done, w- I done went through this. I done learned. I done grown. I got a car. I finished school. Graduated, high, got, graduated my master's degree last year and was like, oh, life is great. I'm, you know, I'm dub, bub, bub, bobbing and weaving. Oh, I got life against the ropes. Like, I'm doing this thing. And life caught me with a couple of haymakers. In August last year, I was leaving work, spent out, wrecked my van. Two weeks later, they tell me that it's total not coming back. That van cost $85,000. Had the city help me raise money for it. Two weeks after that, or yet on that same week that I find that it's total, my dad, who is responsible for getting me up and out of bed, he falls and he breaks his ankle. And I'm now like struggling on how to, how am I going to get, like I'm thinking about him but I'm thinking about me. Um, he has to have surgery, and, what was the, and I have no card to go help him. And my neighbor's helping, a couple days later he comes back, and I remember coming home, he's laid up and got his foot up, and we just too, we sad, boy. It's, it's like, I'm looking at him like, oh, you need help? <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> so my mom comes and is helping us, because my mom lives in Georgia. So my mom comes and is helping out her boys. Two weeks after that, I'm at work, and my mom calls me. I pick up. The apartment is on fire. The apartment is on fire. And I'm like, wait, what? Where's dad? He's out, but the apartment is on fire. I flip on the news in my job, and I am watching my apartment go up in flames. That night at the hotel, here I am, and all this stuff happened within a span of 31 days. At this hotel, I am literally thinking like, yo, what is going on with life right now? And all I could think is like, you know what, I've been through hard things before. I've been, through, I've been in quote unquote dark times and God was there and he's here now. And I just remember thinking to myself how beautiful, like five o'clock in the afternoon is about as good as the time of any to have an apartment fire. Nobody, like no one got hurt. I, could, I was only thinking if I was home at two o'clock in the morning and this thing happened, I, just, I, can't e- I can't even imagine my mom trying to get me and my dad out of there. And so I stayed, like, the news interviewed me the next day, and I was just like, you know what? God is good. And sometimes, like, I, when it feels like there's dirt, like, and stuff just piling on top of you, like, you can, it can feel like you're getting buried. But the, a pl- the place of life and the place of death look very similar. When you plant a seed, where you put it? Underground. When, you pa- when someone passes away and you're burying them, where you put them? In the ground. So now you have a choice now when you're getting piled with dirt. Are you planted or are you buried? And I chose that I'm going to be planted. And i tell you what. Some fruit started to come because a month later, the story got to this lady in, in California by the name of Ellen DeGeneres. She brought me out to the show, oh, wow. awarded me with $100,000. I was able to buy a new van. Now, that van out there cost $110,000. <laughs> Lord knows I'm watching out for every curb. <laughs> every curb. But it just, the season has changed. In a year, coming up on a year later, Habitat for Humanity is building me a house. Man. And it just goes to show. God is good. And when you trust him, he's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of you. I mean, y'all got me in here. My juice is flowing. But look, look, look they, they told me 8 o'clock. That's my time. I just want to say thank you guys so much for letting me come and share. Let's put your hands together again to thank Emeka.
I've heard him speak on three separate occasions, and every time there are a lot of nuggets within what he has to share. And so there was a lot for us to really soak on, uh, as our pastor oftentimes encourages us to do. And so um, we thank you for taking time from your busy schedule to be here tonight, and we appreciate you. I want to let you all know that he is working on a book. That is planning that he plans to uh, be done with later this year. Yes, and if it's not, it'll be early next year. Okay, so we want to look for that. Yes, uh, but we again just thank you for taking the time, and we appreciate what you uh, have shared with us tonight, and uh, we hope to have you back again. Uh, I feel like family here, like so. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, um, we're going to close out. Um, we'll. We just do, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent, one from another. Don't forget to study and pray. Amen. You mean to tell me that was a, a, a repeat after me thing? You are so You're welcome. <laughs>